Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2018 Luminary Series session. Some of you that have been here before will recall that our very first luminary speaker was Mrs. Jean Gurney. And you may know that Jean passed away after a long and virtuous life earlier this season. And I think it might be appropriate to use the occasion of Jean's passing to remind ourselves how precious and fleeting life itself is and to be especially kind and mindful to our luminaries and to our other friends in the American caving community. So thank you, Jean, for your wonderful life, for your dedicated service, and for the gentle reminder. Today's speaker is a true legend in Montana caving. In fact, Mike McKeachern is the man that discovered what is the first entrance to the world-class silver tip cave system. In an attempt to recruit some additional cavers to help with what he was quite certain was going to be a major deep alpine cave, Mike at one point moved to Austin, Texas for that recruiting. To find a place to live in Austin, Mike and several friends moved into what was essentially the attic of a greenhouse and for that housing they assumed the nearly unbearable weight of thirty dollars a month in rent. One of the people that he made contact with was Bill Steele and Bill told me years ago that today's speaker is in fact the man that brought the promise and the potential of Silver Chip Mountain to explore as exemplary as Bill Steele himself. Quite an achievement. As part of his ongoing interest in caves, today's speaker is an expert on cave photography and in particular stereo cave photography. Mike's stereo images have been enjoyed by audiences far and wide. As one example, the wonderful stereo images that you see featuring world-class caverns of Sonora that are replicated, packaged, and sold under the Viewmaster trademark, or in fact made by Mike. Thank you very much for coming today. Please enjoy your afternoon with your 2018 NSS luminary, Mr. Mike McEachern. I'm very excited to be here with absolutely my most favorite people in the world, cave explorers. And uh, this is a, a great honor and uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to my little talk. Uh, and just to make sure that we know where we are in the broad spread of time, we are at the 13th bark tune, the seating of the cock tune, the fifth tune, uh, the 18th winol, and the seventh keen. That means uh, it's been uh, a little over five years since uh, they predicted the world was going to end. Uh, so, anyway, to get on with it. This is life before caving. Uh, my grandmother is up there. She's hearing a little bit of beverage, uh, which was uh, very unusual for, for a lady in, the, in, in that period of time. Uh, but uh, I think that maybe I got some of her rebellious genes. And I was born a rebel. I, I was born in, in uh, Andalusia, Alabama in 1943. Uh, but uh, my dad had restless feet. He liked to travel and see things. So uh, by the time I, I went into uh, school, I was uh, on the sunny shores of California. And uh, my first trip to Montana was uh, in the early 50s when I went up there with my parents and my uncle and my aunt. So you can see me there on my first Montana trip. And then in the... Uh, other corner, of the lower corner of the photograph, you can see my first self photograph. 
My real adventure began in 1963, or 1962, when I saw uh, Bill Halliday's book, Adventures Underground, in uh, the college library. Um, and that changed my life. It also changed my friends. You know, he said, oh, let's go caving. And I say, are you nuts? And, uh, you know, one day I was walking into the cafeteria and, you know, looking for a place to eat lunch. And there was, uh, there was an empty spot next to uh, this guy and a couple of blonde girls. So that seemed like a good choice. And uh, that's where I met Ron Ralph, who uh, would be my earliest uh, cave companion. And asking around, we heard about this cave called uh, Robber's Roost, but uh, it was vertical. So uh, again, going to the library, we got the latest information on how you could uh, safely explore a cave. And, uh, so armed with this, we went to this little limestone pinnacle and, and uh, we had made ourselves a nice set of prusiks, but anyway, we repelled into this cave and it really wasn't very big, you know. We wandered around a little bit in this sort of single room and about a 30 foot drop. And uh, so, well, there's not much here, let's go out. And then we realized we had left the prusik springs at the entrance. So what we ended up doing is we took our carbon light, which we already figured out that's the right thing for a caver to use, and uh, we burned off the end of the rope. And this was a you know big one inch manila rope and it was made of three strands so we could unravel the strands, reconstruct prusik loops, and get out. Another uh, early adventure was another little uh, limestone pinnacle in one of these straight up and down uh, California foothills uh, geography that are quite common. And, and uh, by then I, could gra I had graduated to using a rope ladder of my own design. It was made from, it was made from nylon strap and, and uh, garden hose. And, and it actually worked very good, and I even wrote up a little article for it in the Valley Caver. Uh, but we used that to descend the cave, and, and uh, you can see me in the, in the lower right corner, and in there we are looking for artifacts in the screen. And you can see I found a good use for those horrible Christmas sweaters that my mom did. Uh, but that turned out to be quite a find. Uh, there was perishable artifacts, uh, and perishable artifacts including uh, uh, accords, feathers, uh, and, which was pretty unusual. We had shell beads, we had abalone ornaments, we had uh, uh, bone tools, we had uh, stone artifacts, one which is uh, very interesting. These little guys right here are uh, stone pipes and they are used by Indian shaman to suck uh, bad spirits out of your body that's causing disease. And, and they were made out of limestone. Anyway, this is my very first cave map that Ron Ralph and I made. We had learned how to make it from Tom Rohr, who volunteered to map uh, uh, Pinnacle Point Cave for uh, Sacramento State College that was doing the excavations. And uh, Tom liked to do really precise surveys, but um, uh, he did have a few sort of strange things, which as cavers are used to, you know, a little bit of strangeness. But sometimes when he was surveying, he would just go, bats, 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 bats. <laughs> and sometimes he would say, pussy, 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 meow. <laughs> and when uh, he was especially upset, he would say bad words. So anyway, 
Tom was one of the few NSS cavers we really knew that was sort of in our area and that we'd sort of been with a little bit. So when we went to the, the, our very first uh, California regional, uh, you know, we were anxious to, you know, to be around Tom. So, you know, these other cavers had realized that, you know, maybe we have a little gravitas. So anyway, we waited and waited for him to, you know, come in that Friday evening and, you know, we drank a few beers and so on and so forth. And, and you know, by some time after midnight, he hadn't shown up yet and we gave up the ghost. And uh, anyway, when I woke up in the morning, I looked out and there was Tom Roar's uh, red Jeep. And he was sacked out of the ground right next to it in his blue mummy bag. And it was fairly cold, and so he only had like his ear sticking out of the bag. So I went over there, snuck over there, got up close, and I whispered into his ears, bats, 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 bats. <laughs> no reaction. So I tried it a little bit louder. Pussy, 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 meow. Still no reaction. So then I said, the bad words. He slowly turned and looked at me. And I had never seen that person before in my life. Very soon, he threw his bag in the car, jumped in his Jeep, and got the heck out of there. Uh, so anyway, you know, not just getting, get, getting dirty uh, caving, you know, another great way to get dirty is doing archaeology. And so after having found this site, uh, um, I decided archaeology is what I was want to do. And this is... Uh, the third excavation that I was on, or the fourth excavation I was on, and the, and the hat right there, the white hat right there, that's Jerry Johnson, he's another NSS member. And, and uh, this, is, this is me inside of uh, a little Indian sweat cave uh, that was put out in Cave Note. So uh, I, I really got into the archeology span soon. Um, the first grotto that I was in, and here's a grotto t-shirt, was the Leather Load Grotto. And, and uh, the first trip that I ever went on to McLean's Cave, which had been organized by somebody else, uh, they took along a newspaper reporter. And uh, so you can see, ooh, like a man from Mars, McEachern peers, peers through one of the grotesque formations. Uh, abound in the cave. They didn't seem grotesque to me. I actually sort of liked them. Um, and uh, in the lower left, uh, you can see my uh, hot rod 49 Ford, or my 49 Plymouth. Uh, also in that picture, you can see uh, Bill Roloff's Volkswagen. And uh, Bill Roloff was, it was famous is the guy that invented the mother load ascender, or also known as the roll-off ascender. I've only got one left of my pair now. I donated one to an auction. Another time, uh, we went to Lost Soldiers Cave, and uh, we managed to get pretty darn lost. In fact, we went, we went to one room so many times that we started calling it the ring around the rock room. Uh, and that's when I discovered that, you know, when you've been lost long enough and you see something you recognize, you really don't know if you saw it before or after you got lost. <laughs> um, I did get to uh, do some archaeology at, at uh, Pyramid Lake with the uh, Paiute Indians. And so I took a grotto trip to a Tufa cave at Pyramid Lake. And, and uh, so here are some of the grotto members. And uh, you can see below it, you can see this little rock altar. And that was used by Paiutes, a member of the peyote cult, to have their ceremonies. 
And you can also see that tufikes are very pleasant crawling. Uh, and then the first NSS convention I went to was in 1966. And we went to Church K, we saw the golf ball. And I have a little story about that, but uh, you can ask me about it later. Another uh, uh, nice cave was uh, Cave City Cave. But Cave City Cave had been known historically for a long time and had been quite trashed. But there was one very, very tight crack that was full of mud that you could squeeze through and get to this really beautiful chamber. So anyway, in the bottom you can see us after having squeezed into this chamber. Well, one of the people there, the person on the right, Mark Grady, had to leave, the, leave early for his job. And so he took off, and about a half an hour later, the rest of us uh, you know, headed out the crack. And one by one, we managed to stick our carbide lights into the mud and, get the, and knock off the light. So we ended up on the other side of this crack with everything absolutely covered with mud. You could hardly work a buckle. You were afraid if you got anything out of your pack, you would immediately turn it to mud, let alone be able to try to strike a match and, and light a candle. So we're sort of sitting there in the dark and we see a little light off in the distance. And we yell, and it's Mark, and he had gotten lost on his way out of the cave. And so he came there with a flashlight, and we were able to uh, um, see well enough to be able to restart all our lights. And I ended up uh, doing a, a master's degree in anthropology uh, on mortuary caves of the mother load. And, and uh, my degree is signed by Ronald Reagan. Uh, so I didn't know if I would get, you know, booze for that or not, but... And after that, I got a research assistantship at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, and, and uh, looking for evidence of early man in the Rocky Mountains, and I conducted excavations at a cave in... Uh, uh, Eagle Cave in Crowsness Pass, and that was the same time that Derek Ford was working up there with his students. Uh, so I was lucky enough to go on to the very first trip into uh, uh, some of the caves up there. And here are a few of the local caves that are really nice. This is Col Coltar Cave. You can see this from Coleman, and it's a huge hole in the, in the top of the mountain. And it actually ends in a, in a block of ice. Another really pretty cave was Plateau Mountain Ice Cave. Uh, and here's the Ptolemy Plateau. And uh, here's the Andy Good Plateau, who I was on the very first trip to. And on that day, they found uh, a Yorkshire Pot and Mendips Cave. And it, the part that I was looking at, if I would have gone about a thousand feet further, I would have been the first one to see the entrance to Gigantua. But uh, that didn't work out. But we did do a very exciting trip uh, into Mendip's cave, and that's and in there is Jerry Ayers and and uh, John and uh, one of the Canadian cavers, uh, Harvey, and we got we got down uh, oh maybe three or four hundred feet. Uh, I managed to get drenched in a waterfall uh, while watching the waterfall fall a hundred feet into this massive room below. And uh, I barely got out with the hypothermia, and uh, maybe uh, other gear might be appropriate. I returned to California, where I worked in various archaeological sites, including spending over a month working in San Juan Cave, and then went on an extended trip to Mexico and Guatemala, and, mis and visited classic sites like uh, the uh, Pyramid of the Sun, which uh, I think most of you know has a cave underneath it. Uh, and on that trip, I mapped a couple of caves. One of them was Santo Domingo de Patapa. And uh, amazingly, that cave had a chamber in it that at one time had been totally sealed. Um, and you can see Ron Ralph there looking through, uh, you know, where the wall into the chamber had been broken down. 
And I returned to that cave one more time and mapped like the distribution of pot shirts in it. Um, we also had this crazy idea of taking a, a dugout canoe down the Usasinka River, uh, which people said was unrunnable. Um, and uh, on that trip, I mapped a cave in Guatemala before we lost the canoe by trying to line it down a rapid and the rope broke. And uh, we got some Mexicans to rescue us from the Guatemala jungle. And exiting that trip, I went to Austin. And in Austin, there was this guy, Ed Alexander. And uh, he had his parents' car, and he was from Alabama, and he needed to return it. And, and uh, so he needed somebody else to drive a car out. So, you know, haven't been to Alabama since, you know, I was born there. It was sort of interesting. And uh, so we said, oh yeah, we'll be, glad to, we'll be glad to do that. And we were at Terry Raines' house, and, and uh, you know, we're waiting for Ed to show up. We said, well, we can speed this process up if we go out and, you know, gas up the car so we don't have to stop. And uh, so while we were out gassing up the car, Ed Alexander comes by the house, and Terry Rain says, oh, they already left. They went to Alabama. <laughs> and Ed, Apparently, he looked visibly shocked. Uh, and then he said to Terry, God, they're crazy enough to have done that. And so he jumped in his car and he took off. And uh, we get back to the house and, and uh, Terry says, oh yeah, Ed's who already got to my bed. And eventually we hooked up, but I got to go by the, the uh, NSS headquarters for the first time. And I got a membership into uh, the Paint Rock Valley Grotto. Uh, and coming back to Austin, Bill Elliott was getting to go on a biological collecting trip down there. I didn't really have any money, so I sold him my camera and used that, that money to be able to spend another week in Texas. Uh, while we were doing mostly biological caving, biologically collecting in caves, we also stopped by the type locality for uh, the peyote cactus. And we did collect a few samples. Uh, but later, you know, I was, was still intrigued by Mendips and where this, you know, 100 foot waterfall into this giant chamber went. And so we planned a trip up to Canada to uh, follow up with that, but uh, we had heard a leak which apparently went from Mary Alice to Newell Campbell to Jerry Ayers and, and, and so anyway that's how the lead got to us and we walked right up this valley and discovered this incredible cave system and Dino who was in the audience was the one that first discovered Blood Cave. Uh, so anyway that was pretty exciting and we spent about a week up there but, you know, we still want to do our Canadian trip, and we got back up to that, and the cave was totally iced up. And so we went back to Silver Tip, and we ended up mapping over 8,000 feet of cave uh, on that trip. And then we moved to, uh, decided to move to Austin, and it was Steve Zeman that was really pushing the idea, but it, he didn't have to push me too hard. Uh, and we ended up, here's, here's our attic, our $30 attic that, you know, came out to $10 each a month, so that wasn't too bad. And on the way out there, we stopped at this archaeological dig at Waco Tanks and discovered that most of the people uh, on there, uh, in there, are, uh, were cavers. Uh, and here we are in Austin. There's the greenhouse with the truck in front of it. There's a cemetery behind it. And uh, you can see Mike Boone squeezing through one of the tombstones. And uh, the pictures there the, are, are my hook. That's, that's what I showed to the cave. I said, hey, you really ought to go to Montana. Look at this. And uh, so we managed to uh, load up a school bus full of people and go to Silvertip. And uh, so here, you can see the bus that we came in. You can see uh, uh, Stephen Dino's uh, nice Chevrolet and, and uh, so on. And so we spent many, many summers there. I, I figured out that I've done uh, over, I think, 10 trips to Silver Tip. 
Uh, but in the 1979 and the 1976 trip, uh, I recorded the hours that people spent in various caves. So I think that Bill Steele uh, deserves the glory he has as the great, uh, the great explorer from looking at this list. You can see that S Steve Zeman is, uh, is pretty darn good too. I'm considerably more wimpy. Stone hadn't really didn't really get to full steam in these tiny alpine caves. Preston Forsythe did well. Thomas Moore did well. Palmer barely squeezes on the top seven list with only 39 hours. <laughs> but he did do a lot of work on the surface. Uh, and anyway, so we did over, over 750 hours underground with uh, 20 different cavers and mapped 3.3 miles. And uh, here's some of the crew, starting from the top, uh, from left to right, is Peter Strickland, Frank Benny, Steve Zeman, uh, Bill Steele, Bill Stone, Blaine Colton, Warren Anderson, Art and Peggy, Tom Moore, Nancy Boyce, Dino Lowry, uh, Preston and Sherry, Terry Raines, Lisa Wilkes, and there's a group picture of our uh, 1976 crew. And I need at this time uh, also say that I've lost track of who gave me Silvertip Slice, and so I can't really attribute all of the photographers. I know that some of them were, were Pete Strickland, gave me a lot. Of course, Art and Peggy's Silvertip Slides are famous. Blaine Colton gave me a lot. Warren Anderson gave me some. and. And uh, so anybody else that I forgot, I'm sorry, but I just don't know who took them. Um, also uh, up there was one of the most shocking experiences of my life when Nancy fell down this pit. It's described in the program, so I won't talk much about it, but you can see the pit and you can see the injuries. And uh, she was pretty bold to try to, you know, step across that. I mean, we offered her a rope, but she thought she could do it. And uh, as you could tell in the introduction, we've long been long count keepers. Uh, and this is under Mark, Barbara McLeod's influence. And you can see Gil Ediger working on a, a, a mold to make a, a Mayan stela. And we would celebrate certain occasions when the tune changed. And uh, I actually started starting using the Mayan date exclusively for a while. Uh, and writing that on my notebooks, but it later became uh, confusing. And you can see, you can see uh, Nancy and me uh, with our Mayan calendar uh, displaying it on, on uh, the, the eve of the 13th Bakhtun waiting for the world to end. Uh, and we spent some time down in Mexico, okay, uh-oh. Sometime down in Mexico caving and, and, and uh, Calibre was one of the most exciting ones because we found a fairly intact burial chamber there, including like figurines regarding the chamber. There's this beautiful jaguar pod where you have a jaguar effigy in the handle and then the rest of the jaguar is incised in the pod. And uh, Preston Forsythe took that picture. And we did some Mexican pits. Uh, Oye de Wallace is the four on the left, and on the right is Golden Drenus. Uh, uh, a couple of those pictures are mine. The other two of the people climbing were given to me. I think the one, uh, I think the one on the upper right was probably taken by Dave Bennell. I don't know who took the one uh, where you're looking down, but that's my helmet. We really hadn't planned on going to Golden, Golden Drenus that day. We were going to go to Oya de Wallace, but we ran into people that were going to uh, do Golden Drenus, and they had a, 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 a 12,000 foot rope so you could repel into it. Well, we only had a couple of 600s, so we ended up having to tie a knot in the rope. And so on the way out, about 500 feet off the ground, we had to go over a knot, and that had a little bit of a pucker factor. And here are some images of uh, the Watlet trip. Uh, I think it was 1978. And when they did De Carrizo, 
which they just connected into the rest of the system this year. But one of the strangest things, well, we were living in a little house there that they just divided the house so the cavers could have part and the family had the other part. And we sort of slept up in this attic area and we heard these strange noises that were coming over there. And there were little, they, there were, you know, strange noises coming and we peered through the crack and here was a shaman doing a sucking ceremony with one of these little pipes like had been found in, in uh, Pinnacle Point Cave. So that was really amazing to find this, you know, thousand year old artifact and then seeing it, similar things still being used. Um, I did some research at the, the, the New Maloney's Reservoir when it was being uh, put in. You can see our staff car and going from one edge to the other. You can see Steve, Steve Wintereth was who owned the car, Dave Cowan, Don Broussard, uh, Jonathan Davis, um, brain fart, uh, and then Jim Munsteys. Uh, down in the end. And, and Jens actually d discovered some of the caves in Montana. He was one of the first guys to go into Silvertip. The bad thing about being, you know, paid for caving, you know, some days you just don't want to go caving. And it's terrible to have to get up and go caving when you don't want to. But uh, we did get a, I did do a nice report on it and uh, and it attempted to develop a scaling system for rating caves over multiple areas to determine their relative significance. And then moved on to Alabama. Uh, and here are a couple of pictures from our first trip into, uh, our first trip with the Birmingham Grotto. And this is Myrna Attaway right here. And this is, this is Steve Attaway, Larry Brown, uh, or Larry Moore, uh, Ken Brown, Steve Pitts, Nancy, Valerie Howell, Lynn and Greg McGill. Uh, anyway, these are some of the people that I caved with. And, uh, but I still couldn't get, you know, silver tip out of my mind, so we came up here in 1982, and, and, uh, Marion Smith got to do his uh, thousand pit. And he bugged us all around camp every day. Oh, we're getting up early in the morning. Oh, let's go to a pit. Let's go to a pit. Let's go to a pit. He finally did his thousandth pit. And we think, thank God. It's over. You know, early the next morning, he stopped dropping around. Oh, okay, let's go find another pit and do it. So uh, he never could shake the habit. We also uh, mapped Clone Cave, or, or uh, Sardine Cave. Uh, and you can see I'm still doing stuff in my own writing, but, but uh, now I have managed to plug in the, the uh, American calendar just to, you know, make things easier. Now, one thing about TAG is you have to be very, very secret about what you're doing. So, uh, you know, when you go to a grotto meeting, you say, oh, I haven't been doing much gaming. Um, you know, after a while, it's, it's, you know, they sort of get on to it, but you can stall them for a long time to avoid being scooped. And uh, Iron Hoop was a really, uh, was really an interesting cave. The lead came to the Alabama Cave Survey by some novices who had, who had been to this cave that had already been reported by Marion Smith, but they found a way to some breakdown and it seemed like it continued. And they said, oh yeah, it was okay, we went up there and looked at it, and, and uh, so we did. And uh, we could see their tracks and stuff in the cave, and we saw this like low passage that had some water coming through it that um, uh, didn't have any footprints. So that's where I wanted to go. And uh, so we went down this, down this to a ways, and it was in the, in the middle of winter, and there was, you know, it was pretty, pretty wet and and here was a pretty good pool you had to go through and uh, you know oh I cut my hand I really don't want to get it wet going through this pool and you know the other people that uh, you know they just, they just didn't want to do it and they said well, you go ahead 
So I did, and it was like it was like a duck walk. And so I'm like, you know, I'm just duck walking around like this, and every time I, once in a while, I like to push my head up to see if the ceiling had got up. And I'm doing it, and I'm doing it, and I'm doing it, and I'm doing it. And, you know, finally I raised my head like this, and there is a Carlsbad size formation right in front of me. And uh, I got very excited, but you know, I really didn't want to let on. So, uh, you know, I go back down the passage and I say, it looks pretty good, you really ought to come on. And uh, then I rush back into the chamber and, and I got up by this formation and uh, all of a sudden I started going, all of this time I thought when people, you know, did that in the end snow, they were just showboating. And I discovered that day, it's actually a physiological phenomenon. <laughs> and one of the other caves that we managed to spend a fair amount of time in is Fern Cave. And uh, Fern Cave is real interesting because, uh, you know, in places in it you can see torch marks. There's like this strange fur thing that's in there that uh, I don't think has yet been identified that uh, I think that somebody left there. And uh, there's this pit called the Bone Dome, which uh, had Pleistocene bone in it. And they also discovered a human mandible. And uh, so, of course, I was very curious about that and, uh, you know, went up to look at the situation. And uh, it did, it, since we could see that Indians were traveling in the cave, it didn't seem likely that they came in the same way as the Pleistocene animals. I think they fell down this pit right there. It sort of sneaks up on you and I think he just slipped and fell down there. And that's, that's what happened. Uh, another cave I spent a lot of time in is McClendon's cave. Uh, and in the lower left, uh, you will see uh, Gary Barnes. There was a very muddy section of the cave that we took him with. Normally when we went to that part of the cave, we could only do about 10 stations before our gear was so muddy that you couldn't read an instrument, you couldn't read a tape, you couldn't even reel a tape. Uh, but anyway, that's Gary there. The person in blue is Jerry Salisbury that I came with a lot. And Dave Cottle came up with this idea that, gosh, it wouldn't be bad to you know, drive to Texas for a weekend to participate in the Caverns of Sonora uh, restoration. And, and uh, it didn't take me much convincing. And, and uh, so the, one of the owners there noticed that I had a 3D camera. And she said, well, gosh, I've always wanted a set of Viewmaster reels uh, for, uh, uh, for the caverns. So I volunteered to take those. Oh, how horrible, work for free in Caverns of Sonora. And uh, so we did some of the stuff on the, on the weekend trips when we came over for restoration. And then I went over and spent a week over there taking photographs. And I got my old buddy, Ron Ralph, to help me with it. And you know, for you know, older, you know, dirty men, it was like an ideal job because uh, you know, they would, they would uh, check you out with a you know, pretty little uh, high school girl to pose as your model every day. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and here's the Viewmaster reel. And you can see it's credited on there to uh, Dave Cottle and Ron Ralph and uh, Bill Sawyer, who helped me with the photographs. And uh, it really was one of the most exciting things I've ever done was to have a Viewmaster reel. Also, uh, you know, not just you know going over to uh, Texas. Uh, we had one grotto member who was a Romanian, and he managed to set us up with a grotto trip to Romania. Absolutely the best grotto trip I've ever been on. We went over there for a couple of weeks. It only cost a thousand bucks with airfare and everything, and uh, was able to get some really uh, nice photographs. 
at, uh, in, in 2002, I retired to uh, Montana. Um, and Montana is really different than TAG. It's just not the same kind of caving. But uh, we do spend a lot of, lot of time in the, in the wilderness in the summer. And, and uh, in addition to doing expeditions, I was able to be here for the, the fight to keep uh, uh, caves open. Um, one of my, uh, was our trip to Una Mountain. That's, that's the longest approach that I ever had. Uh, it was about, uh, it was, it was about 30 miles, uh, and it, it was a huge borehole. Daryl Greaser had actually discovered it from an airplane. You can see the crew of us sitting there. And then on the, uh, on the lower left, you can see Red Watson, and I believe that's the last time we got him into a cave. He didn't have a helmet, he didn't, uh, so I got him to wear my helmet. I want him to wear my, you know, my K-pack on his back, and he said, I never wore a pack on my back, and so he grumpily held it by his side. So there's Red Watson in his last cave in his bee suit. Another thing I like about cavers is they really know, they really do know the difference between their ass and hole in the ground. <laughs> Another place that uh, we discovered, and uh, Ron Zerber wanted to go up and look along Scapegoat, or Slate Goat Mountain. And uh, so I started Googling around, and after a while I managed to spot what looked like a couple of, of pits on a ridge over from there called, uh, which, which is called Grizzly Gulch. And uh, so here's a couple of pictures of that. And we found a nice cave there that we call 3OG, 3O geezers. And uh, you can see the geese, you can see some of the geezers down there. These are mostly old time Montana cavers with uh, uh, a few young offspring thrown in. Um, and so that was really an exciting trip. Also got to go to other areas uh, um, like Green Fork Falls and, and uh, more trips to Silvertip. Um, I also got to, uh, to uh, re-photograph images that were taken by Norman Forsythe in Lewis and Clark Caverns. And uh, that was quite a bit of fun because uh, it gave us access to the cave that are off the cave tours. And we managed to find most of the localities where he shot photographs, but not all. And then they closed the caves in Colorado. And they started talking about closing, maybe they would close the caves in Montana. And I really didn't think that was a good idea. And it just happened that this uh, newspaper reporter called me about the time I was learning about this, and it was Rob Cheney. And, and uh, so I told him, God, the Forest Service is going to close all the caves in Montana. And uh, so, bing, it pops up in the paper. And, and uh, my background was such that, uh, you know, I had a few clues uh, how to do it. You know, they were saying, well, well uh, we're going to close all the caves because uh, bats are in caves and, and uh, so all caves are significant. Well, we had fought and fought for the passing of the, you know, the cave bill, and we know that all caves are not significant. So that's in the definition. They can't say everything is significant. They have to say which ones are significant. And then they said, well, this is an emergency closure. And so I said, well, you know, uh, They've, they've had this disease for five years. It's been, you know, it's been spreading slowly across the country. You've known about this for five years, and now you're telling me it's an emergency. And so we got this stuff in the paper, and and uh, so we were able to to pressure them in the, in the emergency uh, closure to get them to have public comments. And so the Forest Service opened things up for public comment, and, and uh, 
they didn't get very many good comments. Uh, and so that started, that, that put pressure on them. And, and uh, so eventually the decision was, was come to not close the case. And there were a lot of very brave wildlife managers that stood up and supported the cavers over their peers in the wildlife industry. So they really put their careers on the line so Montana could stay open to recreational uh, cavers and we could try to get the message out on clean caving and decontamination procedures and just make the public aware of what they could do to make the situations with the bats better. So this has been an ongoing and wonderful relationship with managers that we have here. And the final place I got to dig was in, so far, it was in Natural Trap that uh, our grotto sponsored the the, the rope work in the caves and and uh, so I got to go and dig I brought my own trowel and Ian Chetton took a, a picture of me in the trowel you can see in the lower uh, corner and I have the natural trap some of the natural traps photos in, in stereo views that you can come and see in the Montana room and uh, so now I think I will uh, try to wrap up here with uh, one more image. Uh, and for any of you young explorers out here, here is a lead. I don't think I'm going to get to this one, so I don't mind giving it away. Uh, this is, Silvertip Mountain is up here, that's the little green thing there. This is Limestone Peak. And uh, this is where I think the entrance to the cave is. Uh, so anyway, there it is, and it's up for grabs. <laughs> so, are there any questions? Where are we going to name it? <laughs> whoever finds it gets to name it. <laughs> well, I found it, but whoever, I think whoever explores it ought to be able to name it. Is it true that you got scalped on Silvertip Peak? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> well, actually, I didn't get scalped there. I actually got scalped at my sister's in Hamilton. But uh, you know, the water at Silvertip is really, really cold. And the, you know, the last thing you want to do is like wash your hair. And uh, I'm not very good at bodily habits anyway, but my hair became like a complete mess. Uh, and so several, uh, two summers, I just came, came up with matted hair. And I really, I actually sort of liked the matted hair look. You know, in, in terms of people not bothering you, if you got, if you, if you, if you have matted hair, people were, will leave you alone. But uh, later I found out that uh, if, if you have matted hair, it's a real symbol of mental illness. It, it, the police can actually take and lock you up and put you in an institution without your permission. So uh, I gave up on that look. But yeah, I would, I would go by my sister's and she would clip off these big mats. And so I, have, I still have a couple of them. One year I tried to get the Zippy the Pinhead look where I pulled all my hair straight up. Uh, but uh, anyway, I have these hair mats, and one, uh, one time in Austin, in Halloween, somebody borrowed my hair and used it as a, as a costume. Uh, so anyway, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the bee and scalp story. Mike, do you know how many Montana caves you photographed? Uh, no. I think Mike has photographed more Montana caves than anyone else. He's, he's the prolific Montana <laughs> 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 Mike,
Can we tell the story about uh, Mike Boone coming in? To oh, yes, I wanted to tell that story, and I was afraid I wouldn't have enough time. But I didn't, so that's why I did show that Boone photograph. But uh, when I was up in Canada working in my archaeology lab, I, I, you know, I came in one morning, and the lab manager says, there's somebody in your office. You know, what's that mean? And so I go to my office, and there's this rather disabled, you know, dirty guy uh, sitting uh, in a chair in my office, and the, uh, his pants are split in the crotch. And his balls are actually hanging on the, on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I was surprised, <laughs> and, and uh, so anyway, it turns out that, that uh, one of Derek Ford's um, uh, students that had graduated was, was teaching there at the University of Alberta, so he was one of uh, uh, the early ass members. Ask members, Alberta Speleological Society, but you know he wanted to keep up good relationships with uh, Derek Ford, so he was afraid to help Mike Boone, so he sent him to me. And what Mike Boone had done is he had gone up and slow soloed Castle Guard Cave, living off the stashes that Derek Ford had put in the cave to support him in case the cave flooded. So he not only scooped their lead, but he ate all their food. <laughs> and uh, so that's how Boone ended up in my office. And uh, I was married at the time to my first wife, who was in one of the Cape City pictures. But, uh, uh, you know, so I call, I call her, and she was working, you know. I, I call her and said, oh, we got this guy that's going to, you know, needs a place to stay and, and so on that I'll be bringing home from the university, uh, sort of to give her a heads up. And so she planned ahead and she stopped by the store and she got all the ingredients to make a, a real nice beef stew. And uh, so we bring Boone home and we're, you know, we're sitting in our living room and, you know, after a while, you know, uh, not actually not very long, uh, you know, Mike said, oh, I need to go to the restroom. And, so he wanders off to the bathroom, and he comes back, and we talk some more, and I don't know what's wrong with the guy, but he has to go to the bathroom again, and again. But uh, finally the stew had cooked, and we sat down to eat dinner, and there was not any meat in the stew. <laughs> any more? <laughs> Oh yes, yes. Actually, we had a very hard time going up Silver Jib. We had the map we had was one of the old, old quads. Thirty, you know, uh, thirty minutes. It showed a little. It showed a little uh, a cabin up there, that uh, and a trail going to it. Well, we got up, we got into there, and, and uh, it took us a long time. We, were, we took too much stuff, we were unprepared for how bad it'd be, and it turned into a horrible, horrible bushwhack to get to this cabin. And uh, so, so we got there, and we were exhausted. We had spent, we'd already spent about three days just, just on the darn approach. And uh, so we decided we would, we would take a day off. And, and uh, so, you know, we left our packs and we just wandered up to the creek, to the base of the waterfall, and, and uh, ended up, uh, well, it doesn't look too far to get a little, you know, a little more up that way. So we ended up climbing up the face by the waterfall to get to Silvertip the first time. And and uh, and then later, Steve Zeman found the alternate route to come back down the, the, to the drop point in the way that we go down. But uh, yeah, the first trip was a hard one. <laughs> Where's the Cave City Cave? The what? Cave City Cave. 
It's, it's now known as California Caverns, I think. It's a commercial cave. Any more? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. I uh, appreciate the wonderful talk.